Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful tech leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode was brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Hello and welcome to Level Up Engineering. I am Karolina Toth, and I talk with accomplished tech leaders in the industry every time. Today, our guest is Olivia Liddell from Amazon, who is an accomplished tech leader as well. Over the course of her career, she has created innovative teaching and technical training solutions for learners from diverse backgrounds and diverse skill levels. So welcome, Olivia. Thanks so much for having me here. First of all, please tell us a bit about yourself so we can get to know you a little more. I'm a technical curriculum developer at Amazon Web Services. And in my role, I develop training materials for people who are looking to get certified in uh, various AWS uh, certifications. Before this, I started in my career with uh, teaching. And I used to teach middle school, so kids who are around like 12, 14 years old. And from that, I've learned so much that can really be applied to working within the education context of technology, whether it's in my role with helping people become certified, but also the education of um, like what you see is being called the soft skills, how to help people become better mentors or communicate better, or like today, uh, talking about team building. Awesome. Excellent to hear. So today our topic is using social engineering tactics to build stronger teams. I would like to start with some clarifications. What makes an engineering team strong? You know, I, I was thinking about this question for quite a while before I settled on a good answer. And the thing that kept coming back to mind is the importance of making sure that any team leader doesn't uh, equate a strong team with a perfect team because I, I feel that sometimes uh, people go for perfection without seeing that their team is really strong and capable in, in many other ways. And, and so in my experience, I feel that the strongest teams that I've seen and been a part of are really the ones that uh, have a few qualities like being open to change, being able to incorporate regular reflection as part of their ongoing processes. And then also having a setup where the regular team members feel empowered and actually are empowered to make change so that any new initiatives aren't only coming from the team leader or manager, but any regular person on the team can say, you know, I, I feel like this team can be improved in this particular way. Let's talk about this. And that usually is one of the strongest indicators of a, a strong team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is there a way for us to objectively assess this? Yeah, I think so. And it, it can be tough to do this across the board because so many different teams can have a different makeup or different purposes and goals. But I think if we want to start very generally for people who may be listening to this to think, okay, I've got this team, I need to figure out how strong or not so strong we are right now. What are some baseline questions that I could ask? And some things could include how well does my team communicate within each other? Are there things that we just don't want to talk about? Are people open to hearing feedback and sharing that? And also how easily or how well is your team able to work together and get things done? Like how often do you find yourself coming up against roadblocks and seeing that every initiative has some kind of issue with it? I think when you start with these types of questions, as much as you can back it up with data, that's going to give you a way to assess that and, and also make sure that you're coming up with a strategy for how to move forward from there. All right. So I, I just want to elaborate a little more because I hear that strength has like a really big part of psychological safety within a team. A am I right about this? Absolutely. Yeah. With psychological safety and trust, actually within Amazon, one of our leadership principles that we have is called earn trust. And it's something that's brought up as early as the hiring process. And especially when you're onboarded to your role and starting to work with your team, 
knowing that in, in order for us to be able to work together, you, you have to earn trust. And I think that really plays a big part of psychological safety. And for anyone who, who's listening who may not be familiar with that concept, I would say, in my experience, it can come down to a simple example of imagine that you're in a situation and you need to ask someone on your team for help. You, before you go to ask that person for help, you start to wonder, can I trust them with this? Do I feel that they'll hear me out and help me? Or do I feel that they're gonna listen to me right now, but judge me later or they'll criticize me? Uh, those are the kinds of things that go into psychological safety. And, and why it matters is that if you're part of a team that does not really foster psychological safety, you may end up having some team members who do need to ask for help, but they don't feel that they can. And then your, your team is really in a tough situation to get out of. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we need that in teams. So back to making an engineering team stronger. Is there a process to this? If you could give us the rundown of how to make our engineering team stronger. Absolutely. One of the best strategies I can recommend is make small incremental changes rather than trying to change everything all at once. Ideally, these are changes that can be supported and, and backed with data so that if you're trying to um, improve your team, you can have some kind of metrics that you're measuring that against to see how successful or not as successful those efforts have been compared to before. And also when you're uh, carrying out this action plan, always reflect and refine. Uh, I think that when you pair these two together of making small incremental changes, but also leaving room for reflection and figuring out what went well and how can we make sure to do that again in the future or what might not have gone so well and how can we improve that for the next cycle, a lot of it really relates to some um, many of the project management processes that you see out there where you find a lot of benefit in doing smaller chunks first, even though I know there is this temptation to want to change everything all at once, but slow and steady wins the race. I think that's what the saying is. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the other part of our conversation today, which is social engineering. I have to be honest with you, the first time I heard this term was an episode of the show House of Cards. And, and I was like, what an interesting term. So uh, in your opinion, does it have a negative connotation? And how do you define social engineering in our tech industry context? Yeah, uh, for anyone who's listening who, who might not be familiar with social engineering, a, a definition I always like to refer to is from the Security Through Education website. They define social engineering as any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. And, and so some examples of this you could see in information security someone who's trying to get into a, a physical building and they're trying to manipulate the receptionist to get past the front desk. We're calling a tech support line and trying to get that person to, to divulge more information than they should. And what really interested me about this was I was starting to learn more about social engineering, but also separately from that, starting to develop an idea for a, a team building conference talk. And you go to conferences and you, you see so many different sessions about team building. And I one day had this light bulb epiphany and realized that the two really work well together. There are so many parts of social engineering that can be applied in this positive context, because as you mentioned, it often does have a negative connotation to it. Uh, people look at it as being manipulated and doing things that they didn't choose to do themselves. But I think that part of what makes social engineering such a powerful tool within security is exactly why it should be leveraged for um, anyone who, who wants to try to make better changes within their team. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. So how can social engineering tactics be used to build stronger teams? Yeah, the first part is to observe. And, and this is where a lot of people who've tried to improve their team may fall short because they assume that because they are already part of this team, they already know everything there is to know about the team. So why take the time to look and see? And when you think about how social engineers work, before they go in and, and try to execute their plan, they, they sit back 
and watch, and they watch for patterns. And once you've figured out how your team is working together, what the patterns are, usually from there, you start to get a better sense of exactly what needs to be improved. So for example, you might see that there's uh, some communication issues within your team and possibly the senior members of the team are not sharing their knowledge with the juniors to, to have knowledge transfer. So then you might decide to develop an action plan, start with some quick wins. Like I was saying earlier, don't try to change everything at once, but in the case of social engineering, they will start with small goals. And even if they can't get every single outcome that they want, such as breaking into a building and getting all the passwords, they might still be able to get some small pieces along the way that can lead to bigger ones. And the last parts of this would be observe why and, and how your team members are responding to change because the observation is something that keeps going on even after you've initiated this, this new initiative. And the last part would be figuring out if conflict does arise here, use your observations to help you get people to buy in based on what you know about them. So you, in other words, you're thinking less about why, why you want someone to, to make this change and more about what's in it for them. Why should my team member decide to do this thing that I want them to do? Mm -hmm. Do you have to kind of take an outsider's perspective? Is, is that what it is? Like step back a little bit and maybe not get involved for a while? A little bit, yeah. And it's a lot of it comes down to empathy too. But really being able to see things from another person's perspective and being able to do exactly like you said, like taking a step back and really looking and seeing how your team members interact with each other, how they go about their day, what seems to motivate them to do their job well, and also seeing how this may change in different contexts. So another thing I've seen that can be an issue with this approach if it's not done well, is that some people will do an observation and assume that because they have observed someone acting in a particular way once, that means that person is gonna always be like that in every other context. Right. So for instance, saying, oh, I noticed that John is really outgoing and he volunteered in this one meeting today. So I'm gonna take that to mean he's always gonna volunteer and maybe he will, but it can be helpful to observe your members in other settings because possibly John likes to volunteer when he's with his immediate team members. But if you put him in the larger team, that has like other s smaller subgroups coming together, John might feel a little bit more nervous and anxious and not as open to being put on the spot. Yeah. Right. Is it like you have to let go of your own expectations? Like I'm thinking if I've been at a company and I've been working with this particular team for quite a while, I might have some preconceived notions about my team members, but if I now want to take this social engineering perspective, I kind of have to relearn my team members, perhaps? Exactly. Yep, that's exactly right. Because you really want to think about it from the standpoint of a person who's trying to get access into something to, say, get passwords or other kind of confidential information. When attackers try to get that kind of information that's very high value to them, they definitely take their time with it. Even though they may assume that they know certain things about their target, they still take the time to really take the full lay of the land. And that's usually why they're so successful in that. And it's the exact same way when it comes to a team lead or a manager who is really trying to do better for their team. And I will say this can be one of the most difficult parts of the process because like you said, if you've been with your team for a while, you may feel that you know everything there is to know about them. And there certainly is value in having that prior experience with them, but you definitely want to take the time to take that step back and look at it like with a fresh set of eyes. Like mm -hmm. imagine that someone is coming in to see your team for the very first time. What are those things that they would notice that aren't necessarily coming up to the surface right away? Right. What are some examples of social engineering from your experience? Yeah, I, I was thinking of a few examples of um, how I've used this earlier in my career. And one good example I'll tell you about is from a few jobs ago, 
I was working in higher education as a learning technologist uh, with online courses for various colleges and universities. And um, you can imagine I'm on a team working together with about 12 different program directors for, who were directing programs like accounting, education, healthcare, all different topics. Every semester, I needed uh, the program directors to give me some information that I needed to be able to get their courses up and running. And there were some directors who gave me what I needed right away, no problem. But there are others who semester after semester, I would have to track them down and, and try to get them to, to give me what I needed. And you can imagine how this results in backlogs, processes being delayed. And after a few times of this, I thought this needs to be improved. I, I don't know what's uh, causing this. No matter how many times I ask, I'm still not getting what I need. And then I thought about it from a social engineering perspective where I used the strategy of thinking less about what was in it for me and more of why would these different directors want to do this for me? And one example of this, there was a director who was working with the accounting program. So accounting and numbers and graphs and data. I knew from my experience with her, that like, that's how she thought. She was very, very analytical. And so one time when I needed to follow up with her again to, to get this information that I needed, I thought, this is probably not going to work, but whatever, let me just give this a try. In that email with my request of, hi, can you please make sure to give me the information that I need and so forth, I included a, a few uh, data points. I said, we were working with 100 different course sections and 50% or this and that. I mean, all the data was correct and it worked. Once she had the data, she saw that like I was appealing to how she thought and, and what she needed because it was like I was speaking her language. Now, here's where it comes down to knowing your people because if I had done that exact same approach of putting in uh, statistics and data and figures with someone who is in a different program like um, education, that totally would have missed the target with her with the special education program director knowing that she was someone who was really all about the caring side of, of education and learning. In my email to her, I emphasized things like, as a result of getting us the information earlier, this gives me more time to be able to provide hands-on assistance for people who need it. That appealed to her. So on the one hand, it did take me a little bit more time to think how I would target that. But once I did, it, I got what I needed. Mm -hmm. and it was like magic. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. what I hear right now is that social engineering is really kind of in context together a lot of times with like attacks being made on certain systems. And I know that you are also an ethical hacker and you had mentioned security and how your team might be, you know, at risk for, for someone who wants to extract information. But in, in this case, we are really talking about catering to our team's needs, sort of? Exactly. That, like figuring out what they are receptive to, perhaps. And in this way, perhaps social engineering has like a more positive effect because we are using it for good. Exactly. Because you're still using that same kind of approach of thinking, well, if I'm trying to get, if I'm a, a, a cyber attacker and I'm trying to get someone to give me their password when they shouldn't, and I know that they're really into um, um, bicycling, perhaps I will uh, talk about cycling and, and I'll send them some links and get them to click on that. It, it's catering to them in that regard, but they don't realize it. And I've gotten the password and it's not a good thing, but you're right. In this case, it's the same kind of approach of catering to them. And the only way that you're able to do that is by making those observations and knowing your people and knowing that uh, they're different and where it, it can come across as taking a little bit more time to do because it's easy and, and, and time efficient to just do the same approach for everyone, right? right? To say, I'm sending out this one email, I'm making this one announcement, everyone do this thing. And you have some who might do it, but then you want to make sure that, especially when it comes to new initiatives or big changes that some team members might not be as willing to buy into, that you're really keeping them in mind and what motivates them and ultimately 
you get them to do the thing, but you also have them walking away feeling good about their decision to do that because they have done it for the reason that relates to their motivation and not your motivation for them. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So now that we have explored and really, hopefully, our listeners put social engineering on the positive side of their fans, what mistakes have you seen made with social engineering? What can you tell us about it backfiring in a team? For example, if, if someone is, isn't really comfortable in the social engineering game, what should we watch out for? Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, you definitely want to make sure that when you're going into this, you know what to do, but also what not to do. And I think the two things that I would really emphasize here would be making sure that you don't make overall assumptions about a person based on a single observation, because you really want to give that person the benefit of the doubt in many ways. You might catch someone on an off day, someone who might not be as open to sharing feedback or they're kind of heads down working on their own project that day. And if you look at them that one day, you may think, oh, well, Sally never wants to talk with anyone. That's a problem. Now we need to, to fix that. But it's, it's a single day. And so really ensuring that as you're doing this, you're looking for common patterns and trends that you see. And the other um, would be, as we've mentioned before, but it definitely bears repeating, uh, assuming that you already know there is, there's everything to know about your team because you're a part of that. And being able to take that step back and see it with fresh eyes is, is a really good thing to do. And as I was thinking about this, I, I was wondering, well, what would I recommend for someone who really is struggling with this? Like, let's say there's someone who listens to what we've talked about so far, and they're still saying, you know, Olivia, I, I just can't do this. I, I don't feel like I can look at this in this way. Another recommendation I have is something that I first did when I was going through my teacher training program. It was myself, another uh, teacher in training, and then we had our mentor teacher who was there. So it was like a, a classroom with three teachers and then we're all teaching our class together throughout the year. What I really appreciated that my um, mentor teacher did for us at the very beginning of the year, she sat the three of us down together and we all talked about not just our preferred working styles, but questions like, what do you enjoy most about our team and your role within it? What motivates you? How do you prefer to be communicated with? And how do you prefer to handle conflict? I think when you have these, kind of, these kinds of discussions as a group, it helps to normalize things because everyone is able to share uh, within whichever range of what they're comfortable with. So it isn't just that one person on the team who doesn't really get along with everyone saying, you know, you're the outlier, so you need to tell us about how you handle conflict. I, I think that the a benefit here of having this kind of sit down conversation and asking people flat out, tell us what motivates you, the others are taking notes on this. And then it, it's not to say that you don't do any observations beyond that, but at least you have a baseline. You can say, well, Mary told me that she's motivated me, that she's motivated by having a lot of technical challenge. I've noticed that the projects she's worked on recently have been a little bit easy for her. So perhaps she's not feeling as motivated now. What can I do to fix that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I feel like this is a new tip, like really sitting down with your team and establishing kind of their boundaries and their like motivators and how they like to be talked to and, and stuff like that. Am I Am I hearing this correctly? Yeah. And uh, for people who've never gone through that before, I know I felt a little bit like, is it okay for me to be honest here? But I, I think the key is to do this before you have conflict or when you're not in a point of team conflict, because then uh, the, 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 the dynamic between the team is probably going to be a little bit more tense than it would otherwise. And so this is a way to be able to uh, build that trust that I was talking about earlier and help the team members to feel that psychological safety. Because I can tell you, for example, I've been a member of teams where I'm someone who I prefer if there's like some bad news or a big change coming up, when possible, I prefer to get a heads up about that before the meeting. So I have some time to look at it, process it, think about it. 
But then other members of the team would say, please don't tell me anything in advance that I have to read because that adds on to my day and I feel more stress and pressure. So please just let me get to the meeting and tell me then. So that's something that our team manager would, wouldn't have known that we have these differences there if she hadn't asked. And the other thing about this is that you, you can't always accommodate everyone with every single preference, especially if you have a, a significantly larger team. But I think that in terms of trust and psychological safety, it really goes a long way for team members to know and feel that their manager has even just asked about that. Mm -hmm. Because even if my manager can't accommodate me with everything that I want, at least uh, I know when uh, he asks, what do you prefer? It lets me know he cares. And, and that means a lot. Right, right. I hate to bring up the little negatives when we are talking about managers who care for the teams. But what are the common conflicts um, that might come up because of social engineering? Yeah, I, I know I've been saying trust a lot, but I'm going to say it again, because that's a really big one. <laughs> and and the, the reason I bring this up is that as much as we've been talking about building trust and having that be a good thing, if a social engineering based approach to team building is not handled well with good intentions, you as a team leader can potentially uh, end up having your members feel that you're spying on them, that you're doing this just as a power trip. You're doing this to micromanage them. That's a, it's a very fine line to walk. And so I do recommend that depending on your team, you may want to clue them in to establish what you're doing and why to say, hey, everyone, I know that we've got some things that we can fix. And just to let you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be just looking to see how we interact with each other, just so that I can have specific things that I can refer to for improvement. I think when you establish that and, and make it very clear that's why you're doing it, you're making it more likely that your team will trust why you're doing it. But if your team sees that you're overly scrutinizing their work and overly like looking into what they're doing and micromanaging without also pairing that with solid actions for improvement, that's where you have the lack of trust. So you want to make sure that you don't fall into that. Mm -hmm. Before you mentioned that one shouldn't draw conclusions on a single behavior. And now you also said, you know, like, Maybe let your team know that you are trying this new approach to to making the team better. First of all, I, as a scientist, I'm thinking about observation bias. If my team knows that I am observing them, they are not going to behave the way they usually behave. But mm -hmm. also, what is the time frame that you would recommend our listeners take if they are trying out the social engineering approach? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it can all depend on what it is that you're trying to change. I, I would say usually if you're listening and you're deciding if you want to try this, don't just try to pull things out of thin air and say, I want to fix this. Really ask yourself first, what's your gut telling you about what what can be improved with your team? And I'm just gonna go with the example of communication. Like perhaps you're feeling like communication and knowledge transfer is something that could be improved. So you're starting with an idea in mind and then you're able to tailor your um, observations based on that. I would say probably take at least a couple of weeks at minimum to observe and watch, especially now in this day of people working remotely, a very common question is, well, okay, how can we do this when we're not actually in the same place together? And this is where you want to observe how people communicate within different contexts. For instance, this is someone really, really talkative when it comes to being in the chat room and they, they, they won't stop and you almost want to mute them. <laughs> But then when it comes to the actual real time voice calls, they're, they're very quiet. And it's not to say that there's a right or wrong, but what are you noticing there? So you want to give yourself at least a couple opportunities to see this in action, to see the different contexts there. Also be aware of the, the timing of this. Perhaps if you're doing this in the middle of your team or your organization's busiest season, that may not be the best time to make these judgment calls and observations based on 
let's just do this when we're in like a, a non-stressful time. It, but it, it all varies. So I would say at least a couple of weeks. And I, I agree with what you're saying, that it could be the case that some team members will say, oh, now I'm going to be on my best behavior, knowing that my manager is watching me. But uh, as you go throughout, really make sure that you're getting multiple data points. Because I think over time, even the people initially who may be thinking, I'm going to do everything differently, it's hard to keep that up <laughs> for right. a long amount of time. And I mean, hopefully, if you do have someone who is trying to do better, that might actually result in them doing the thing that you want them to do anyway. So that's a win win. <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have touched on a lot of things. We talked about, you know, building stronger teams and how we define stronger teams and really just like taking social engineering out of its regular context. And really, we went through some very productive tips, I think, for our listeners to try this out. Is there anything that you would like to add that we haven't touched on? Hmm. The only other thing I would add would just be to um, really have fun with it, if you can. And I hope that if for anyone who decides to go through this, they uh, they see this as a, a different but helpful approach for improving their team. One thing I, I, I'd love to share that I've had as a result of presenting this talk at various tech conferences over the past year, there have been people who've come up to me who've said, you know, Olivia, I've always heard about security, but it always seemed like this dark corner of the, the tech world that I was always scared to go into and I never thought that I could. But thank you for presenting this topic because now I'm motivated to go learn more about that. So I, I really hope that for anyone who does uh, go through this process and learning more about social engineering, that'll encourage you to learn about other parts of security as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Where can we follow your work? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Oli Ravi. It's like ravioli, but flipped around. Mm -hmm. And at my website, which is olivialadell.com. And on my website, you can go to the speaking area and I have a full slide deck that has additional information about everything we've talked about today, as well as links to articles and books for anyone who wants to learn more about social engineering and team building. Awesome. We be sure to check it out. It was a pleasure to have you on board today. Thank you so much. Would you like to have a say in Level Up Engineering? Is there a topic you'd like to hear your fellow tech leaders talk about? Submit your questions to levelup at codingsense.com. Today, our guest was Olivia Liddell, and she is Technical Curriculum Developer at Amazon. I am Karolina Toth, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com. <laughs>